Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your host of Nova Science Now, where this season we're asking six big questions. On this episode, can we make it to Mars? We would love to take a walk on the red planet, but can we get there alive? You can go from a perfect day to a very bad day that quickly. Their space rocks way faster than speeding bullets. All of a sudden, I look and see the solar panel just instant hole this big. This is why it's so dangerous to send out missions. They can take out a spacecraft. And cosmic rays punching through our brains. I would see a flash and flash, flash, flash. And our cells. They are a bullet traveling at an enormous speed. Researchers are spinning up some ingenious plans. Don't let the force leave you. To keep astronauts safe. But will they work? And if astronauts do make it to Mars, what will they wear? Humans can't survive without a pressurized suit. Basically, the gas in your lungs would boil. You would be dead very quickly. NASA astronaut Mike Massimino. I feel like an Italian sausage. Looks into a revolutionary new idea to keep Mars explorers alive and kicking. Also, would you eat a piece of meat that's been sitting around for eight years? I did. This NASA lab is cooking up food for the long journey to Mars. Eating in space is already no picnic, but with or without gravity, some of the space meals are delicious. Mm, I like that. But can they stay tasty all the way to Mars? Now, this looks nasty. That is. <laughs> all that and more on this episode of Nova Science Now. Four decades ago, humans first walked on the moon, satisfying our thirst for exploration. And now, we're setting our sights on another rock out there, Mars. A trip to the red planet would likely cover a half a billion miles, about a thousand times farther than the Apollo missions. A round trip could take two or three years. And one big challenge is surviving harsh conditions, including some we don't encounter here on Earth. Here in the New Mexico desert, home to all sorts of top secret government projects, NASA has built one of the world's most powerful guns. Some 60 yards long, it targets spaceships. Though not alien spaceships, our own. The gun simulates cosmic collisions that will threaten astronauts traveling to Mars. So you guys call this a gun, mm -hmm. but it looks nothing like a gun. Mm -hmm. I think of a gun, I think of handguns or rifles. How fast does a rifle bullet go? About 2,000 miles per hour. And what do you pull out of this? 20,000 miles per hour. 20,000 miles an hour. That's fast. The most surprising thing is not the gun's size or power but it's bullets. These itty bitty things, mm -hmm. 20,000 miles an hour. They represent a danger that could end a mission to Mars. Space is not as empty as you might think, but littered with small fragments of comets, asteroids, and planets called meteoroids. In the vacuum of space, they move at deadly speeds. And NASA's huge gun demonstrates just how dangerous they can be. These metal plates represent the walls of an unshielded spacecraft. This is a half-inch projectile, and it was traveling at about 16,000 miles per hour. It made a hole in the front plate, mm -hmm. and then a slightly larger hole. It kept going. Yes, so an astronaut could be right behind this wall. And Whoa. this is what is left over. It's essentially a shotgun blast. The speed of the impact shattered the bullet, and its debris smashed ever larger holes in the inner walls. It's a sobering lesson for NASA. 
Meteoroids have already knocked out or damaged numerous spacecraft, including the probe Mariner 4, which snapped the first close-up pictures of Mars in 1965. After its flyby, it ran into a cloud of meteoroids no bigger than the size of a grain of sand. And over the course of about 45 minutes, they were seeing thousands of impacts on the spacecraft. Another meteorite strike was witnessed by astronaut Jerry Lininger. During my time on the Russian space station, all of a sudden I look in the corner of my eye, I see the solar panel just, you know, instant hole this big. If astronauts are to survive a mission to Mars, we have to find a way to protect them from meteorites. And so today, the gun will test new lightweight shielding for the walls of a Mars spaceship. It doesn't look very protective. It, this is foam I can stick my finger in. But it's a smartly designed shield because <laughs> what happens is the velocity is so fast of these projectiles, when they impact, the speed breaks it apart, and then the rest of this target will absorb the impact. So will this shield stop a projectile going over 16,000 miles an hour? To find out, the shield is bolted in the target chamber. Then, air is pumped out to replicate the vacuum of space. We head to the bunker below for protection while the gun gets fired. Three, two, one. That was cool. And the result? Did the shield stop the bullet? Well, obviously it went through. Yep. And... But just look at the inner wall. No penetration. Nothing came out the other side. That's right. It worked. The layers of foam, metal, and bulletproof materials pulverized the debris from the impact. So this takes out all the energy of those projectiles. Mm -hmm. And it stops it. So this is where astronauts would be. They could be cooking breakfast here. Yeah. They're safe from the hazards of space. Well, not really. Meteoroids are only one peril of many. Systems failing possibility of a fire, possibility of losing electrical power. You can go from a perfect day to a very bad day that quickly. Some threats aren't so obvious. In fact, one of the biggest looks like harmless fun. Many astronauts report that being weightless is what they love most about space. Yay! I would wake up in the morning and fly to breakfast, then I would fly to work, uh, I could fly to the bathroom, and I even flew while I was going to the bathroom. I was Superman every single day. But what feels good may not be so good for you. As Jerry Lininger discovered after spending five months in zero gravity on the Russian space station. By the time I got back, I had about a 14% bone loss. Now, that was isolated to hips, lower spine. And my strength level was probably 65% of what I went up there with. With no gravitational force to work against, your body not only doesn't need the same amount of muscle and bone, it starts breaking them down. As on Earth, so in space. Use it or lose it. An exercise may not solve the problem. I exercise two one-hour periods every day religiously, and my personal experience is that the bone loss seems to just keep going on and on. And yet, there is a solution. Artificial gravity, a force created by spinning. You can see it in the sci-fi classic 2001, A Space Odyssey. And you can experience it right now in this small spinning room at Brandeis University. As I did recently with neurophysiologist Jonna Kaplan. Notice how we talk to each other, but we don't look at each other. Yes, well, I want to look at you, but I feel don't. it's hard. <laughs> I'm trying to conduct a conversation, but I'm having trouble turning my head. The rotation, you see, is generating a centrifugal force that pushes everything in the room away from its center, towards the wall. It makes me lean pretty oddly, 
But as far as my body is concerned, Very good. this force is no different from gravity. To move, I have to work against it. <laughs> okay, now I gotta turn around. Turn around slowly. And I mean work. Peel, everything That's what I'm doing. Peeling motion. No chance of muscles and bones wasting away around here. It's the centrifugal force which is pushing him backwards, so he feels like he's got to fight so hard to get away from the wall. And he may feel as much as 30% heavier. Always feel the force. May the force be with me. Don't let the force leave you. Now, remember, this room is on Earth. So, spinning or not, our planet's own gravity is always pulling us downward. Meanwhile, the artificial gravity pushes us backwards. The two forces combined make things hang in here at odd angles. And this is also why the room eventually makes some visitors a bit queasy. But if I were free of real gravity, artificial gravity would have me jogging comfortably on the wall, just like they did in 2001. Now, building a spinning spaceship isn't practical. But a small spinning room on board might suffice, giving astronauts an Earth-like exercise space to keep their bones and muscles from wasting away. Though that's not to say Mars explorers will be safe, even remotely. Because they'll still have to face the worst space danger of all. A danger astronauts see simply by closing their eyes. I used to sleep upside down, piece of Velcro around me, close my eyes, and then I would see a flash. And flash, flash, flash. You'd get this single point of light, and then a big circle around it, right there in your brain. The flashes are caused by cosmic rays, subatomic particles like protons, generated by exploding stars far off in our galaxy. Traveling close to light speed, these high-energy particles will pierce a spaceship and its astronauts, their retinas, their brains. This doesn't happen on Earth because our planet's atmosphere and magnetic field protect us from the constant barrage of cosmic radiation. You go to Mars, you're going to get a very heavy radiation dose. There is no way to protect against that. If you can't carry light up into space in a wall that would be thick enough. There's not much to stop them because they are so energetic. They are a bullet traveling at an enormous speed. Pelted by this highly destructive kind of radiation, DNA breaks apart, predisposing the cell to cancer. Research continues. But we have yet to find a practical defense against cosmic rays. You go to Mars, you're raising your risk of cancer lifelong. But there are always innate risks to space travel, and there's no way to get around them, and you just do your best to minimize those risks and control them where you can. So we might be able to protect our Mars explorers from some of the dangers they will face, but only some. Yet knowing all that, today's astronauts are undeterred. In my mind, it's part of our genetic code that we should explore, see what's beyond the mountain. And I would love to be the first person to step on another planet. Just imagine what that would be like. Everything you see would be completely alien to your experiences here on Earth. It would be just an amazing, amazing experience. I would go to Mars under any condition. I would dearly, dearly I'd like to take my wife with me. Human evolution involves exploration. Now, I don't care what the risk is, that's something that you actually are moving mankind forward. It is worth your life, and I'd sign up for that mission in a heartbeat. One thing obviously lacking in space is air. Now, of course, air is crucial for us to stay alive. Our bodies need a constant supply of oxygen. Here on Earth, air provides something just as essential, but much less obvious, pressure. Consider this, 
A column of air, one inch across, stretching from the ground to the top of Earth's atmosphere, weighs about 15 pounds. That's about the same weight as a small dog or a watermelon. We don't feel it, but that weight is constantly pressing against our bodies and within our lungs. Without it, we'd be dead. NASA astronaut Mike Massimino has survived the deadly vacuum of space. We got him to tell us how and what we need to do before humans can safely walk on Mars. Astronauts like me might not like to admit it, but space is a dangerous place. I've walked in space four times. That's me doing repairs on the Hubble Space Telescope. And every minute I'm out there, I know, the only thing between me and oblivion is my spacesuit. First step, getting dressed for space, is to put on some undergarments. So now I have on my TCU, or thermal comfort undergarment, which is slang for long underwear. And underneath that is my mag, or the maximum absorbency garment, which is slang for diaper. And that answers the question of how do you go to the restroom if you're locked inside of the spacesuit? At roughly $10 million, today's spacesuit is one of the most expensive garments in the entire solar system. And a lot of that expense goes into creating something you wouldn't expect, air pressure. Because the astronauts have to take their own pressure when they're doing their spacewalk, you can think of the spacesuit as like a big bag of air. So why is air pressure so important? What would happen to our bodies without it? If somebody gets sucked out of the space station without a spacesuit, what would happen? Well, that would be a very bad day. You would not explode. You would just slowly expand and you'd get to a certain spot and then essentially turn to a, a goo, a mush, and then sort of vaporize. You would be dead very quickly. Basically the gas in your lungs and even the solution in your bloodstream would boil. The cells in your body are filled with dissolved gases like oxygen and nitrogen. Without air pressure pushing hard against these cells, all that gas is going to bubble out of solution. Just like it does when you open a bottle of soda. We cannot survive just the human body in the vacuum of space. So we have to have protection from a spacesuit. But how much air pressure does the spacesuit need to keep us alive? Down here on Earth, the one atmosphere of air pressure at sea level feels very comfortable. As you rise up in altitude, there are fewer air molecules around you, producing less pressure. At 30,000 feet, the height of Mount Everest, the pressure drops to only one third of an atmosphere. Luckily, as long as there's plenty of oxygen, humans can survive okay in one third atmosphere. And that's the amount of pressure they put into the spacesuit. The whole spacesuit is pumped full of air, like a balloon. But even that causes a major problem. It makes the suit incredibly stiff. You can think of it as like a football. When a football's not inflated, you could bend it a little bit. But when it's pressurizing, you would not be able to bend it. And the spacesuit's not that different. And all that stiffness makes the suit extremely hard to move around in. In space, I use up a lot of my energy just fighting the suit. The stiffness is particularly noticeable in the gloves. The pressure that keeps me alive makes it really difficult to use my hands. If you took a rubber band and wrapped it around your fingers, and if you just open and close maybe 15, 20 times, you'll get a feeling of what makes it so physically demanding. Astronauts have been on the front lines of the battle between mobility and life-saving pressure since the beginning of space travel. By the time Neil Armstrong made that giant leap for mankind, it was clear. Leaping was doable. Walking, not so much. Trust me, I know. These suits aren't made for walking. These suits are made for walking, and that's just what they'll do. If we want to send human explorers to Mars, we're gonna need a new kind of spacesuit. We have to have much more robust suits and capabilities before we can even think about going to Mars. Back down on Earth, at my alma mater, MIT, a former classmate, David Newman, has set up a space-age garment district 
she's trying to create a new spacesuit specifically designed for Mars. Her biggest challenge? Perfecting a whole new way of producing life-saving pressure. My passion is, you know, astronaut performance. Is there a different way, a better way, perhaps, to provide pressure? And the solution? Dava wants to shrink wrap astronauts and apply the pressure directly to their skin. Hollywood's been shrink wrapping space traveling actresses for years, but the goal was purely aesthetic. No one knew if you could build enough pressure into a tight suit to keep an astronaut alive. So Dava does a lot of experiment. Let's roll up your pant leg. All right. We're going to show you a prototype of mechanical counter pressure, meaning when we apply the pressure directly to your skin, we really want you to have maximum mobility, just like you would in your street clothes. Yeah. So I'm going to put the suit completely on your, like shrink wrap an astronaut. Okay. We need to provide a third of an atmosphere. And we've been working on that for about 10 years. Could we provide enough pressure to keep someone alive? One way to find out is to wrap body parts in super stretchy material to see if you can apply pressure uniformly. Otherwise, it could hurt. I feel like an Italian sausage. That's what I feel like. Wrapping people like sausages is just the beginning. Davis studies human motion, trying to preserve mobility while maintaining pressure. She even tries out her spacesuit ideas on a robot. I'm collecting a lot of data out of the robot because it informs our spacesuit design. But even the tightest girdle-like bodysuit can't provide quite enough pressure to keep a person alive in the vacuum of space. It just isn't tight enough. If we put the astronauts into a compression stocking, that's great, but it still only gets me two-thirds of the way there. How can I get the rest? Looking for inspiration to solve the problem, Deva turns to the animal kingdom. The possibilities are endless. The balletic bat, the slithery snake, or the creature with the highest stature in the animal kingdom, the giraffe? I always wondered, why don't giraffes faint? That's a tall creature. His head's down, eating on the grass, puts his head up to reach the tree, five meters. Why doesn't he faint? So what about a giraffe's physiology keeps its blood from rushing out of his head? I actually think giraffes have like an internal G-suit, an instantaneous pressurization. Special muscles in the giraffe's blood vessels constrict to create pressure. That blocks the blood from escaping out of his head. Maybe we can learn from nature biomimicry and, as an engineer, put that into some of our designs. The constricting vessels in the giraffe's upper neck inspired the idea of building additional pressure into the suit with a tight web of super strong red fibers. Now what I'm doing is giving you a bit of structure. Through that structure, I can actually even carry more pressure. So if you just had the complete suit here without the lines, you'd be able to move around in it fine, but you get, wouldn't get the pressure, the protection you need to work in the vacuum of space. Right. But the red lines need to go in just the right places so they don't inhibit mobility. Though we don't have a complete full pressure suit yet, we're getting there. And Davis built a slightly looser mock-up. This could be the spacesuit of the future. I can't wait to see what she looks like. She calls it the bio suit. You look like a superhero. I want to be Elastigirl. Yeah, Elastigirl. You look like Elastigirl. You look like a. It's just futuristic. Amazingly, a combination of tight, stretchy fabric and a stiff web of fibers looks like it can provide the necessary pressure directly to the skin. Then you see some... But it isn't easy. What is the hardest part of the body to pressurize in this suit? It's definitely the elbows, the joints, and the concave areas, the back of the knees, armpits. Those areas are really complicated. I volunteered to test drive her suit in space. Unfortunately, the mock-up isn't mission ready. And it only comes in lady sizes. When are you going to be ready for prime time? We would really need a few more years of research. So that's where we're at in terms of the development of the suit. A fully functional bio suit will contain smart wires so scientists can monitor your vital signs. The hard back plate will support the oxygen tanks needed for breathing. Speaking of breathing, that part of the suit would be pretty much the same as today with a gas pressurized helmet. But you'll breathe easier. Davis found you could run around in the bio suit and consume about 50% less oxygen than you would in today's bulky suit. 
We've proven the technical feasibility. This is possible. We might have this incredibly different way to design spacesuits for the future. I may be too old to go to the Red Planet, but it's almost certain that the astronauts of tomorrow will have a very different wardrobe than the one I've been wearing. They'll have suits that are made for walking. Even after just a few days in the fridge, a lot of food can get pretty unappetizing. Mostly because mold and bacteria begin to take over your food. So imagine eating meals that have been sitting around for two to three years. That's what the astronauts who go to Mars are gonna have to do. You know, I met some chefs trying to cook up some delicious dishes that'll provide all the comforts of home. Ooh. <laughs> Even when the dining room is a hundred million miles away. In a food lab at the Johnson Space Center, Michelle Perchonik heats up pork chops for a taste test. If you're the type who likes your food fresh, this isn't the meal for you. One of these chops has been sitting on a shelf at room temperature for two years. The other has been lying around for eight. That's right, I said eight years. Can I tell which one? And will my stomach mind this experience less than it did artificial gravity? We shall soon find out. I think this one's older. So in other words, it wasn't obvious to mm -hmm, me that mm -hmm. one was eight years old and one was two. But if I were to guess, I would say this one. Because the meat was just a little mushier. And I'm thinking maybe it would break down over time. Actually, that one's the two-year-old product, and this one's the eight-year-old product. So I was wrong. You were wrong. <laughs> Michelle heads up a team figuring out how to feed astronauts all the way to Mars and back. Food will have to be nutritious, last for years, taste good, and, of course, behave itself in zero gravity. You see, weightless foods tend to do the darndest things, which limits the menu. Anything that can just float in the air easily is a problem. It's going to get in people's sleeping bags, it's going to get in science experiments, it's going to get in people's eyes. One of the reasons I cut my hair when I was up there was I was worried about people at the dinner table eating and then a piece of my hair comes by and floats in their mouth. Astronauts cook by adding cold or hot water to freeze-dried foods or heating food pouches in an electric warmer. A pair of scissors, in space more useful than a fork or spoon, opens the meals which actually can be pretty good. As I discover, courtesy of Vicki Claris, Michelle's colleague. Okay, what's next? Okay, we have one of our thermostabilized entrees, Fiesta chicken. Thermostabilized, again, it's just preserved. Preserved. Okay. Shelf stable. Preserved is a little more appetizing than thermal stabilized. <laughs> <laughs> Put simply, it's a way of killing germs with heat. And I see Cyrillic characters here in Russian. Well, actually, in Russian, it translates as party chicken. Party chicken. Which, which was a little difficult for our Russian colleagues to understand. Uh, we'll taste this. Mmm. I like that. It's a very good product. Good for Earth orbit. But what about Mars? When it comes to feeding an expedition like that, problems multiply. Michelle and Vicky must plan 7,000 meals and snacks to nourish six people for up to three years. And if food is sent ahead of the astronauts, it will have to keep for five years. Yet only seven of NASA's 65 thermostabilized edibles have that kind of shelf life. The rest end up like this. Now, this, this looks nasty, I just that want to say. That is very nasty. So what you're looking at here is our citrus fruit salad, five-year-old versus two-year-old. So something happened between two and five years. What? There's a lot of chemistry going on. Literally. Even no if you kill off every microbe in sealed food, 
it still contains sugars and proteins that react with each other over time. The result is obvious when you compare this youthful and geriatric chicken salad. So the chicken gets darker and the greenery becomes pale. Yes. And it's not just a cosmetic phenomenon. No. You're losing nutrients. Exactly. You're losing... You're losing flavor, nutrients, probably texture. You're losing everything. A solution might be new packaging that keeps out all water and air, unlike today's plastics. With that packaging, we get about 9 to 12 months shelf life. And so there is no way we're going to Mars with this kind of packaging. Nor can we use foil. Fine for low Earth orbit, but too heavy for Mars when you're launching 22,000 pounds of food at the cost of a million dollars per pound. There's also something else to consider. When you're in space, stuck inside basically a can, food becomes kind of a highlight of the day. You have to eat in order to survive. But what people don't understand, I don't think, is the psychological aspect of food, because it is one of the few pleasures that you have control over. And I think people serving on submarines have long understood the importance of food for crews' well-being. Since good food makes astronauts happy, I asked Michelle and Vicky if there's a popular dish they'd especially like to send to Mars. Well, I think that would be our shrimp cocktail. That sounds good. <laughs> our shrimp cocktail is freeze-dried product, so this has been rehydrated. It's not only the shrimp, it's the cocktail sauce. It's the sauce. If Earth were 50 million miles away, this would be five stars. But on Earth, I've had better shrimp cocktail at, at the local... I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it better not have been freeze-dried for what I was paying for it. If you have to cross a great distance with no pit stops, the slower you go, the more supplies you're forced to carry. And if your route takes you through dangerous territory, all the more reason to speed things up. It's especially true for a round trip to Mars, which, with current technology, might take two or three years. Correspondent Jake Ward caught up with some folks trying to revolutionize spaceflight. And if their plans work, future spaceships would go so fast, they'd leave our long-distance traveling woes far behind us. The space between Earth and Mars is filled with stuff that can kill you. Meteoroids can smash your spaceship to bits. Zero gravity eats away at your bones. And cosmic rays increase your odds of getting cancer. The risks all get worse the longer the trip. Right now, the best rockets would take two and a half years to get us there and back. Two and a half years is what I see as the biggest risk going to Mars. Why so long? The problem is fuel. The fuel in this shuttle tank weighs almost a million pounds. And that just gets you into near-Earth orbit. Mars is still more than 35 million miles away. You can't carry enough fuel to fire engines all the way to Mars. In fact, a chemical rocket would empty its gas tank just escaping Earth's gravity, and then would let momentum carry it the rest of the way. Now the problem with that is that you're coasting the whole way. Which takes a very long time. The other problem with that is that if anything goes wrong, you're stuck. You have no abort capability in mid-flight. Former astronaut Franklin Chang Diaz is well aware of the dangers of such a mission. At that point, you have no choice but just to continue to go. And God forbid you lose propellant or you lose an oxygen tank, and it's not going to be possible to really return. And we would watch this crew die for months in front of the whole world. To make sure this doesn't happen, engineers are designing new kinds of rockets that could go much faster and more efficiently. They range from water vapor thrusters going nuclear. 
but none can get a crew to Mars and back in less than a year. So this is it. This is it. But here outside Houston, Cheng Diaz and his team are building a potentially game-changing rocket called the Vasimir. The ultimate goal is to have a small sun in the engine. A sun in the engine? Well, kind of. The Vasimir uses radio waves to heat argon gas to a million degrees. So hot, it becomes a plasma. The sun is made of plasma. In a plasma, atoms break down into a soup of charged particles that move very, very fast. And if you fire these very hot, very fast particles out the back of a spaceship, you've got a rocket that can really move. But putting this sun in the engine creates some new problems. Think of this candle as a conventional rocket. It's plenty hot, but Vasimir It's really a whole other ball of wax. Test firings have already topped a million degrees, thousands of times hotter than a chemical engine. So the challenge for Vasimir is, how do you keep an engine this hot from destroying everything around it? Uh, this was 316 stainless, and it was in the way of the uh, of the plume coming out and it wow. pretty much, it did a pretty good job. Yeah, I don't know much, but this is broken. I know that much, holy cow. Fortunately, there may be a solution, magnets. If you can encircle the million degree plasma with a strong magnetic field, it will form a heat shield and stop the plasma from destroying its surroundings. With this shield in place, Franklin thinks the Vasimir can go 35 miles per second through space. That's fast enough to get from New York to Los Angeles in roughly a minute and a half. That means you could cut down the round trip to Mars from two and a half years in a chemical rocket to just five months. And by getting about 5,000 miles to the gallon, you'd be lugging around a much smaller gas tank. In 2014, they planned to test the Vasimir engine in space for the first time when they attach it to the International Space Station. After that, they hope to get it ready for deep space travel. And if it's successful... It completely opens up, not just a mission to Mars, but it opens up potentially the entire solar system to human exploration. It might take a while before we have the technology to get a human safely to Mars. But in the meantime, we're already exploring the red planet. So, what's it like on Mars? What's it like? It's freezing, that's what. The dust. All right, move five meters to the right and pick up that rock. That's easy for you to say. You know what dust can do to your servos? Come on, give it a try. Give it a try. I don't believe this guy. Okay, so today's Martian robot explorers don't have that much attitude. But in this episode's profile, we meet a designer who thinks maybe they should. Vandy Verma is a natural-born trailblazer. I really love adventure and exploration. She constantly looks for new discoveries to make and obstacles to overcome. From climbing mountains to flying planes to her job as rover driver at NASA. I've always loved exploring the environment I was in, and the rovers allow me to explore another planet. Humans may be decades away from visiting Mars, but Vandy gets a first-hand look at the red planet every day she goes to work. Through being at that console, she gets direct virtual presence on the surface of Mars in a way very few other people in the world do. She is one of the people responsible for making sure the rovers, Spirit, an opportunity to make it through each drive safely. NASA originally scheduled the mission to last just 90 days, but that was back in 2004, and the vigilance of drivers like Vandy has kept the rovers alive and exploring much longer. Vandy began dreaming of this interplanetary adventure back in 1997, when NASA sent another rover, Sojourner, to Mars. 
So when the very first Mars rover landed, I remember reading about it, and I was just amazed because it was such an amazing thing to do, to get a rover on another planet. And I was like, someday I want to work on that. Her passion for out-of-this-world exploration traces back to her childhood in India. I first became interested when somebody gave me this little book about space. And it was the first time I realized just how vast the universe was and just how different the various planets, even in our own solar system, was. And I wanted to see them. It seemed like a very remote possibility, but I never gave up hope for it. The odds were stacked against her. Growing up in a traditional Indian family, Vandy was expected to follow her mother's wishes, to settle down and enter an arranged marriage with a nice Indian husband. My parents have an arranged marriage, my sister has an arranged marriage. For whatever reason, it, it wasn't something that I was ready for. Vandy dreamed of following a different path, inspired by her father, an Air Force pilot. Unlike her cautious mother, her dad encouraged her to take risks and seek adventure. After high school, she took her first big step. She moved to the United States and studied engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. But that didn't stop Vandy's mother from trying to arrange a marriage for her. She would find people in Pittsburgh when I lived there. I was amazed, and they would call me. <laughs> Vandy dodged her mom's suitors long enough to meet classmate and fellow roboticist Paul Tompkins. Like Vandy, I've been in love with space for as long as I can remember. In 2005, they decided to spend their lives together. We both love adventure. They share a love for taking risks, but not chances. It's very natural for me to take risk. At the same time, it's calculated risk. So she has the element of adventure on one side, but then she's smart about it because she's not going to take a foolhardy risk. She realized that this calculated risk mindset would also help navigate her new field. I discovered robotics when I was at Carnegie Mellon, and instantly I knew this was what I wanted to do. Robots are incredible for exploring space or any areas where it's hard to send humans because we don't have to worry about survival, you know, food and water. While getting her PhD, Vandy headed to the Atacama Desert in Chile to hone her robot driving skills in its Mars-like terrain. Atacama is a place where they measure rainfall in millimeters per decade. And that was a perfect place for us to take our robot and do an astrobiology experiment to look for life. My research focused on making sure that the robots could handle unanticipated situations. This work caught the attention of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab offered her the chance to explore the surface of another planet from a distance. Really, the center of the world when it comes to robotics is at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So she headed to Pasadena, California to join the Mars rover team and brought her motorcycle with her. Mostly I used it as a commuting bike to get from home to work, but I'd always take the longest path possible and the most swervy. Her means of transport was another way to get a little adventure out of life. As a rover driver, she pushes spirit and opportunity to get as much data as possible without breaking them. Safety is the biggest concern, but you can't be so risk averse that you don't go anywhere. We don't use a remote control to drive them, so we're not driving them in real time. We get the conditions under which the robot is in today. We use those and plan a drive and then we send it to the rover, and the rover executes it on its own. And then once it's complete, it sends us back the information. We've personified these two vehicles. They're, they're like our children. They have human characteristics. They're intrepid, they're accomplished, they're dutiful, and, and they're so darn cute. There is no GPS on Mars. You can't just say, hey, you know, this is this location, drive to that location. So just moving the rovers is a certain amount of risk. And there's little room for error when driving on another planet. Mars is a very dangerous place. It has very little atmosphere. The temperatures are incredibly cold. There are huge changes in temperature every day. So these rovers have to endure that kind of environment. They are solar powered. So if the rovers get too cold or if they get starved for energy, which is just the same way as a human being starving, they could die. Since some of the most interesting places are the hardest to get to, the rovers constantly face the danger of getting stuck. 
and the drivers brainstorm different ways to get them out in a replica of the surface of Mars called the sandbox. There isn't one obvious right way to think. You want to explore the options. So the sandbox is a great way to do that because you have one chance on Mars, but in the sandbox, you could reset and say, well, that didn't work. Let's try a different strategy. You may choose to drive forward. You may choose to try to do it with a slight turn, an uphill turn, or drive backwards, maybe wiggle the wheels in order to loosen the terrain up. Once we figure out what solution works best, then we do it on Mars with that one chance we have on Mars. The JPL team has avoided an end of mission since 2004. That's more than 25 times longer than the original plan. And this run has been key to the rover programs revolutionizing our knowledge of Mars. The rovers have detected signs of past water. We've detected minerals that show that there was water. And since water is the elixir of life as we know it, these findings suggest fantastic possibilities. What the rovers have found is that Mars at one time was much more like the Earth than it is today. And this is very exciting and very intriguing because if it was like the Earth at a time when life started on the Earth, did life start on Mars or is there life there today? Whenever you see some sort of a discovery made by the rovers, you sort of feel that you help them along. It is a little bit parental feeling that, hey, you know, I'm proud of that rover. <laughs> And, like the rovers she drives, Vandy continues to create her own path and make new discoveries. When I was growing up, I always thought it would be really cool to work on space, and it just seemed so impossible, because everything that was going on at that time was halfway across the world. And now, when I do look back upon it, it is very amazing to think that, wow, I am very fortunate to be able to live what I dreamt about. And now, for some final thoughts on space travel. In the early days of the great ocean voyages, the explorers and shipmates were brave, or crazy. During their year-long voyages, they risked and often succumbed to scurvy, dehydration, starvation, disease, pestilence, hostile natives, and of course, shipwreck. These were the known challenges. Add some mysterious unknowns like is Earth's edge just over the horizon? Or do demons lurk there? And you've got a voyage that few, if any of us, would ever take. Yet, some humans embrace these risks, and our species owes them boundless gratitude. With space as the next long voyage frontier, another laundry list of life-threatening challenges await us. Food spoilage, wayward space debris, loss of health in zero G, psychological effects of isolation, and once again, shipwreck. Now, consider that in 1950, the risk of asteroid fragments colliding with your spaceship was not only unknown, it was undreamt of. Same holds for the damage that solar flares pose to DNA of spacefarers. Today, these are known unknowns. We know they're out there, and even though we won't always know when they strike, we can, in principle, protect against them. But what's scarier than known unknowns are unknown unknowns. Stuff we haven't thought of yet, but would put an astronaut's health or life at risk, such as, ha, we haven't thought of it yet. That's why we call them unknown unknowns. And that's why, to explorers, today we call them astronauts, the frontier will forever be the home of the brave. And that's the Cosmic Perspective.